Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, bearing with us during some technical difficulty. Uh, welcome to the second iteration of the MFA Artist Lecture Series. Uh, tonight, uh, Cole Wiley and Caitlin Wall will be uh, sharing their work. Uh, and you can notice that there's a slightly different format from uh, our first iteration. Uh, Caitlin and Cole will be sharing together this evening. They're doing a joint uh, joint lecture and it should be a fun new format. Um, hopefully you even picked up a bingo card on your way in. All right. Um, I will uh, introduce Caitlin and Cole. Uh, also allow me in this moment to say on Thursday night, uh, we have the third iteration uh, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. here in this very room where Dontre Major and A.L. Carmona will be sharing about their work as well. So that will be the third installment. Please join us for that as well. Y'all ready, Cole and Caitlin? Toast. Okay, all right. <clears throat> H. Cole Wiley has an undergraduate degree in sculpture with a minor in digital art and computer science from Louisiana State University. After graduating from LSU in 2012, he moved to New Orleans to follow his passion for art and participate in the tight-knit technology startup scene. In 2014, he co-founded Scandi, a 3D scanning company, and spent the next eight years writing software, growing a team, and running the company. During the lockdown of COVID in 2020, he realized he had strayed from his greatest passion, being an artist and actively engaging in an artistic dialogue. He applied to the Tulane, U the Tulane MFA program to resuscitate his dormant practice and evolve his work from the conceptually limited art created during his undergraduate years. Determined to surpass the offering of only a gimmicky, and technology-based Big Kid Exploratorium, he has returned his practice to material-based explorations and sharpened his focus on how we define consciousness and arrive at the vision of ourselves we carry around with us. Please join me in welcoming Cole Wiley. <laughs> Caitlin Ezel Wall is a sculptor, preserver, and historical restoration artist. She explores decay, vulnerability, growth, and time through the treatment of glass, found objects, light, and plant material. Caitlin received her Bachelor of Arts from Hampshire College with an intersectional focus on sculpture and literary journalism. Caitlin moved her life and her glass studio, Perif, to New Orleans 15 years ago. As curator and a primary resident artist, Caitlin co-created and co-operated the art space Potence Collective from 2017 to 2020. The pandemic gave Caitlin an opportunity to step away from running the gallery and from her client wait list. She realized it had been too long since she failed at making something, which meant that she wasn't taking enough risks. Caitlin is currently a Mellon Community Engaged Research Fellow and a Taylor Center for Innovative Design Scholarship recipient. Caitlin is enjoying Tulane as a rigorous residency and an opportunity to more fully integrate her studio practice with her social justice commitments. Her dream job is to be a sculptural journalist, and she is diligently working to define what that might be. Join me in welcoming Caitlin Wolf. All right. Anyone walked over to make through here, then feel free to walk, walk around while the dinner intro is happening. I have more. Oh my gosh. All right. So a couple of things before we get started. Uh, if you are on this section, please feel free to use this exit if you need to get up uh, and leave during the presentation. That'll save you from having to uh, to walk right through the middle of things. Um, so this exit is provided as a uh, easy out. Um, also, hopefully you grabbed a bingo card on your way in. If you don't have one of these and would like a bingo card, um, please raise your hand and Cole will bring the basket around. 
Um, Caitlin and Cole thought that making uh, art jargon bingo cards would be a fun way to break the ice and pierce the stuffy veil uh, of the use of those words. Um, if you get bingo, and by getting bingo, um, this is where <laughs> the rural North Carolina get, comes out of me. All right, if you get bingo, we're going five in a row tonight, people. We're not going four corner. We're not going blackout. We're going five in a row bingo. If you get five in a row bingo, you don't yell bingo in that moment. You hold on to it, uh, and you're going to notify uh, Kayla and Nicole after the fact, um, and you're going to receive a limit. I mean, uh, yes, a and I quote, limited edition print of a collaborative work of theirs. Now, for those of you that are joining us from home uh, on Zoom, um, you can scan. There we go. You can scan the QR code that you see on your screen now to play along interactively. You at home, you're gonna need five in a row. This is not four square, this is not this is not blackout bingo. Okay. I'll take one row. Yep, or it can go diagonal. <laughs> we can go vertical, we can go horizontal, we can go diagonal tonight. You also win a box of cheeses and a roll of paper towels. No, that's merit. Uh -huh. All right. That's what that's what we used to play for. All right. All right. Um, so do please uh, pay attention to the bingo cards um, because these words will be used during the lecture. All right. And that's the least formal introduction I've ever done. In my life. All right. And the last little bit of uh, presentation all that we have here is a point which on the side of the yeah. Oh, wait, flower. I forgot this. Yeah, it's not, we don't know what has entailed into it. It's Chinese currency. All right, flower deck it is, which it was meant to be. This is one we're on. Um, thank you, Aaron. We wanted a casual intro. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to have a good time here. <laughs> and thank you for really throughout the whole process helping us write this thing one assignment at a time. It, um, yeah, it came together nicely. And thanks to everyone who is here and on Zoom. There are two of us out here. How wacky, right? Yes, we're doing this lecture together since we have a close working relationship that isn't collaborative in our studio practices, but is collaborative conceptually. And we were drawn to create something together. Our work and the way we make it is very different. The casual observer could think that our work isn't in conversation in subject matter, or content, and process, or in form. But we're not casual observers. And this lecture is about the value we find in our commonalities. You can think about this as a sermon for inter interdisciplinary relations. We're going to show you some of our work to get things started. Caitlin's is on the left and mine is on the right. So we're calling ourselves intellectual collaborators. Caitlin, do you want to provide a little color on what intellectual collaborators means? Intellectual collaboration is the co-authorship of ideas. For us, those conversations help us dissolve our thought silos and release the illusion that our ideas are our, our own. I decided to come back to school because I wanted to reinfuse my studio practice with rigorous scholarship. And I benefit from idea collaboration with all of my cohort members, as well as many, many people in my life. The collaboration with Cole, however, is uniquely impactful, in part because of our shared commitment to precise language. It's central to our friendship. We've built a, le a shared lexicon that, to be honest, lots of people see as overly academic or obscured. 
But for us, our brand of art speak functions as shorthand, a more direct way of communicating with one another. It's about clarity of communication and about inclusion. We are aware of the exclusionary nature of academic language. We have fun talking like this, but it's less fun when it keeps others out of the clubhouse. Kayla and I both have a privileged educational background that trained us well to play at academia. The language of the ivory tower was designed as a gatekeeping mechanism. It's problematic to perpetuate that legacy. We see solutions in opening the doors and windows to the tower and turning the moat into a public pool. Progress is iterative. Dismantling and examining language is for play and it's for progress. We experiment with language as a way of understanding what we ourselves think and then adjust our language with the goal of seeing a spark of deeper understanding in the other. It feels really good to be understood. It's exciting and it creates a fertile space where ideas pile up on one another and are strong and flexible enough to extend to concepts that are not in the immediate conversation. Cole and I trust one another as critics of our work as well as of our ideas. We've influenced one another's approaches and help one another uncover the content of in our work. So Caitlin, how do you find out someone is your intellectual collaborator? Well, in our case, we were lucky enough to be studio neighbors for a year and to take the canon in crisis class taught by the brilliant Alexis Pulata. And this is really our intellectual collaboration origin story. In reading the same things and trying to decipher them, we recognize the high level of nerdiness in one another. <laughs> Within the first month of our meeting and less than 20 text messages exchanges in, I get a screenshot of a section of text that is underlined with coal in the margin. What is this <laughs> section that Caitlin finds critical for my examination or thinks is pertinent to my practice? If, if modernism's, modernism's domain, domain of pleasure is the space of autobiographiality, this, this pleasure dome is directed on the semiological possibility of the pictorial sign as, as non-representational non and non-transparent. Non so, so that, that the signified becomes, becomes the redundant, redundant condition of a reified signifier. I wrote Cole's name in the margins because I didn't fully understand that sentence. And even though we were just getting to know one another, I thought he might understand it better than me, or he'd at least be down to muck around through the weeds with me. I'm glad I seem like that kind of guy because I totally am. <laughs> when I'm trying to understand a complex problem, I break down the elements I don't understand or can't understand in context of the whole. You can see here how I translated it on a digital sticky note, of course. This allowed me to plug this back into the sentence and reread. While it's still dense and difficult to understand, it's now stripped of the words I don't grok. So at least I can understand everything as I read it without having to process the words. After seven hours of grappling with this translated text, it hit me. Krauss is writing with the most symbolic language possible, words so dense and full of symbology and reference that you have to associate them with other things. This is what she's writing about. She's writing about a thing and the way of the thing. This just hit me. <laughs> yeah, Krauss is a she, not a he. Um, the paragraph was intentionally obscured in order to deliver a more nuanced message. And now Pleasure Dome is part of our lexicon. What a wonderful little treat. <laughs> you might be thinking, y'all seem awfully proud of this intellectual prefix to collaborator. What's the difference between this and any of your other collaborators? Excellent question, you astute audience member. <laughs> when I'm collaborating with a technical partner, like my friend Michael, our conversations are quite different. You can see in this text message where I'm sending Michael literal computer code. This is G code that you send to my drawing machine. And we're talking serial bot rates. He had a possible solution to my problem. It didn't work, but it was a great suggestion. Michael is a mechatronics engineer, meaning he designs mechanical systems that use electronics. So we're talking ones and zeros or torque and friction or any litany of other nonsensical things since we've been close to 30 years now. I find it hard to oscillate between conceptual or research aspects of the art process and, and the technical. 
when I'm collaborating on a project with another friend who's an artist like James Goder, we're usually talking process and methods when we're in the studio. It's really hard to measure something in 30 seconds of an inch while also talking about the emotional resonance of the thickness of line and how that conveys desire or brevity. Either you cut the beam to the right length or you meta-analyze the connotation of line thickness. I can't do both. Well, I can't do both effectively at the same time. <laughs> the other day I was loading a kiln and somebody came up behind me and I thought it was Max, my casting partner. And when I turned around and saw it wasn't him, I had to like laugh and apologize because I just said, I like talked to the person in this like shared language, it's like garble, it didn't mean anything. And <clears throat> And thinking about language, it made me think about Mac, how Max and I have logged enough hours to get ourselves in and out of sticky situations that have helped us develop a very it's silly form of code. Here are some images of me casting and kiln forming with the help of my friends. The hot shop has its own language. There's lots of vocabulary that doesn't make sense if you don't know. And hot glass is the team sport or a very fun cult. We're always open to new members. <laughs> Classes, registration's open right now, actually. <laughs> um, I pull a lot of cane to make my weavings. Here's Sammy and me pulling cane. Um, <clears throat> I don't pull cane alone. And making cane isn't a fast process. We've no noticed that the mood that we're in and the conversations we're having while we work affect the glass harvest. As always, the glass doesn't lie. It records every little conscious and unconscious gesture. I've been reading a lot about Japanese basket makers. Most of the process is in growing and harvesting and culling the bamboo to prepare it for the sculpting, which comparatively is a very short part of the process. And I'm finding there are distinct parallels in my own cane process. I think it about that every time we pull cane. Both in the studio and out in the field, my chosen collaborators are people with whom I have effective physical chemistry. For instance, my friend and colleague Adam Torek is a, one of my favorite, my very favorite person to carry obscenely heavy, fragile objects with. I really appreciate that we only have to say a few words to be on the same page. We build and signify trust among our collaborators through word choice. In all of these cases, we use language as a tool to make art. It's part of our process. And since art jargon is part of our process and the fodder for a lot of our jokes, we're gonna walk you through a few of the words that we've been using most. We don't want our jargon to be exclusionary. We wanna spread it far and, uh, far and wide. You don't need an MFA to play along. Beauty is one of the words on your bingo card. <laughs> Cole will start our splaining off with a quick rant. Cheers. Oh boy. Uh, beauty is a word I try to avoid. People think it means something universal, but actually doesn't say anything specific about the work. People also think it's a nice thing to say about art when they don't know what to say. Lush, gentle, supple, kind, nourishing, radiant, these are all better words for describing elements of what someone might mean when they say beauty. Also, historically, beautiful was shorthand for describing delicate, weak, non-working, genteel women. They were meant to be admired, and that is all. Oh, and bear children, but that's just a practical thing. <laughs> the carryover to contemporary times implying feminine is weak and meant to be admired for their appearance is something we can change bit by bit by choosing better words. So beauty is an inside joke. And the grid has been a another major theme for our whole co cohort. You probably heard, especially John, um, Sean talking about the, we the grid this uh, on Tuesday, or this is Tuesday, I don't know, anyway. They do understand how, we're think how we think about our work. It's good to know what we're referring to when we mention the grid. We're referring to the underpinning of all of existence. The grid is everywhere. It is everything, including non-material, such as time. Trying to ignore or deny the grid is like trying to avoid we're all dying. You don't have to live in fear or run at a full sprint. Reflect on it 
invite it in, give it space when the time is right and quiet it down when it's not. We wrote an outline that could turn into a whole other lecture about the grid and the weave and how they're different and how they're the same and how important they are, both are to our work. But we don't have time for that now. So we're just gonna give you some quotes to set the stage. Rosalind Krauss wrote many things about the grid and this is one of them. The absolute stasis of the grid, its lack of hierarchy, of center, of inflection, emphasizes not only its anti-referential character, but more importantly, its hostility to narrative. This structure, impervious to both time and to incident, will not permit the projection of language into the domain of the visual, and the result is silence. The canvas is a physical incarnation of the grid, where it is woven textile. And the computer screen that I'm looking at is a two-dimensional array of individually addressable LED pixels. So if you want to describe both of these things that are clearly related, you need an abstraction like the grid. They are both used to paint pictures upon and communicate. So we use the grid as a structure to present these ideas on top of. But when you get down to the physical level, we call them something different, a display and a canvas. And here's another quote about the grid from the contemporary quantum physicist Carlo Rovelli. Physical space is the fabric resulting from the ceaseless swarming of this web of relations. The lines themselves are nowhere. They are not in a place, but rather create places through their interactions. Space is created by the interaction of individual quanta of gravity. Mm. An expert who studies the material makeup of existence, asserting that the universe is in fact discrete and finite, is pointing to the importance of emergent properties. The major theme I've been studying is consciousness. And as we, and as an intelligent species, we've been studying human consciousness for as long as we've been studying the physical world, and if not longer. If the quanta's weave provides the fabric for space-time, then the neurological corollary is that the neurons provide the grid that our consciousness uses as scaffolding. The weave implies dynamism and fluidity, while the grid implies static and is purely a concept upon which we make marks. Let's assume everyone who makes art of any kind makes it as an attempt to communicate. They might be communicating only with themselves, or they might be trying to convey an emotion or an idea to another person, group, or to the whole world. Art is a grappling with the human experience. It's making marks on a material to explore being alive. Be they sound in air, letters on a page, handprints on the cave wall of a cave, or like in my work, shadows that are cast, these marks are forms of language. And the goal is to feel expressed, which it turns out is predicated on being understood. It's not enough to intend to communicate. It's not communication unless it's received. An important note, not all information or all art is for all people. This is something that bears repetition. If you don't understand or connect with someone's work, it might be because you're not the intended audience. It isn't for you. As artists, we make marks. It's essentially all we can do. The dance between mark making and sense making forms the most critical aspect of our studio practices. And it's what forms a bond between Caitlin and me. Looking at one another's marks and making sense together is how we collaborate. We explore materials with our hands and make sense of them with our words. Mark making is the evidence of an occurrence. It's an object's history. A mark is an artifact of a moment in time. We both put our materials through a multitude of interventions and then try to interpret the stories the marks tell. Whether the mark is made by the artist, a dripping faucet, or a dragging wheel, the results can be, well, beautiful. 
There's a dangerous fallacy with mark making that we try to be cognizant and critical of, the singularity of any specific occurrence. For us, mark making isn't about doing a process once and then deciding whether we like the results or not, because we're not trying to cultivate the Midas touch or to see value in everything that we do just because it's evidence of our existence. We're intending to communicate by developing a visual language. As Bob says, fall in love with the process, not the piece. That doesn't mean that we always know what we're trying to communicate before we manipulate materials. This is where being good scientists comes in. We use very different tools and materials, but we both set up experiments and then repeat them over and over, taking notes about what we did and what we see as being expressed. We're generous observers. We're students of material and we learn through iterative process. We're willing to make things that aren't meant to succeed as finished products. <laughs> Even though we've been professional artists for quite some time, <clears throat> it wasn't until grad school that we learned and started to use the distinction between subject matter and content. Subject matter is, visual, is visibly identifiable, the object seen in the work. And content is the meaning and the intent that is implicit and explicit in the work. The difference isn't just semantics. It changed how we choose subject matter and then freight it to convey our content. We've both identified that for us, less overt, more sparse, intentional subject matter allows for the content to come through more clearly. We're increasingly drawn to blur and obscure the subject matter through leaving voids or overfilling it. Perhaps this is what the content, the chosen content demands, and perhaps it's a response to the times that we're making it. Throughout the past year of art making here at Tulane, the pictorial plane of my art has severely deteriorated in its fidelity as the subject matter shifts. At the same time, the research into the content of the work is presenting itself with more nuance and tangibility. My research into consciousness and self-identity led me to this book. In it, Norbert Wiley explains. <laughs> I'm supposed to yell it out. <laughs> Norbert Wiley explains that the present self, I, converses with the future self, you, about what the past self has done, me. This hit me so perfectly. I was trying to express this idea in my own writing and image making. I was writing about how I think of my past self as a different person from my present self and my future self as someone I'll never get to know. But we all do things that affect one another. Past Cole started reaching out through time aided by technology. I found this old portrait, self-portrait, on my hard drive that I hadn't seen in over 10 years. I printed it out on high gloss photo paper and reflected on it. I was allowing my content to lead my creative practice. The research was guiding my hand and mind in subtle subconscious ways. I knew it was gonna happen though. <laughs> I began having conversations with this past self through light, and lens. The predominant subject matter of this photo these photographic conversations are cameras, screens, and obviously me. The content, however, is identity, reflection, self-portraiture, time, and technology. Moving into the spring, I was interested in portraying what memory looks like not my memory of a specific place, time, or person, but the experience of remembering. I was sharpening the focus of my content from the overarching concept of consciousness and self-identity to a very specific aspect of them. As the content became more specific, the subject matter became less representational and more ambiguous. Until eventually, the subject matter was simply movement, line, and saturation. Blas referred to these as future nostalgia. Staying with video for a moment longer, this piece has been a work in progress for about a year now. 
I'm going to set this up and then step through the slides rather than try and talk over the video and audio. I promise your mind won't be able to handle both audio video and me talking since it's probably struggling to even hear the words I'm saying over top of the video alone. Aren't our minds funny little things? Over the next few slides, we'll see the same video processed into drawings and paintings, but presented in several different ways with varying audio. I want you to reflect on how the subject matter shifts. Does the content stay the same or shift too? How does the varying audio affect the content? Okay, I'll stop talking, I promise, and we can reflect. As you can see in the beginning, the subject matter was a town, an artistic style, two artistic rendering techniques, and two screens. Progressing from there, we see the subject matter of the two screens becoming more of one screen, just altering its relationship with the room and space. The screens digitally become one and a relationship starts to emerge about when each rendering technique overtakes the other. The audio has emerged as a more dominant subject really setting the pacing for our mind to process the information and literally driving the relationship between the rendering styles. And finally, the screens have been born physically into one shared canvas and the materials of the work start to become a subject unto themselves. The movement of the plastic sheet plays a key role with shifting the alignment between the frames. As the subject matter shifts, the content too changes from the specific idea of an individual walking, driving, or flying around a specific place and broadens to the more general concept or feeling of trying to remember a place for a time. The subtle shifts in the audio and presentation give room for our mind to broaden and connect in new ways. I found myself needing the work to move from digital to physical. The digital nature of the photographs and projections were definitely conveying an important aspect about memory identity, and how we navigate group consciousness in our present times. But I still felt it was missing a part of the story. When I think about the evolution of myself, the passage of time, the uncontrollable effects of others upon me, I don't feel that in a projection. I don't feel that on a screen. Where is the tragedy? Where's the longing? Where's the buildup of time and the decay? In writing for Aaron's seminar class, we were asked to describe the content of a recent work. Here's what I had to say about this painting. What happened to this picture? Who attempted to save it? And why do I need to inspect the carcass? The river valley must be important to the person who traveled there, or perhaps the hunting lodge that the image hung in was beloved by the family. Regardless of the source of the love giving and elevation of status, the tattered image remains on display despite its worn down nature. Too precious to attempt to restore since the deterioration now takes on a crucial role in the life of the image. The threads of the canvas are on display more clearly than the river. The experience of the passage of time flows slowly forth like the still breeze shuffling the leaves through the dense trees. And we reflect on the blank patches like ripples in the eddy pools nearby.
During my last thesis committee review, I was heavily challenged on why I was working from these particular images. Is there something about this tree you want to investigate? Great question. It was easy to answer, but hard to figure out why. The easy answer was no. There was nothing about these particular images I was speaking to. I was using them as a way to investigate content and their subject matter wasn't relevant. So how can I push an image past its signifiers and connotations? Duh, Cole. Abstraction. I had already been heavily focused on the surface treatment of the work. So I evolved my rendering style to avoid direct representation. This is still a work in progress. I haven't had much time to work on this beast with this lecture looming over me. I wanted to focus my intentions on the way that the crusty, craggly brushstrokes and paint medium force our mind to assume things about the buildup of material over time, the layering of the physical preservative medium over digitally mediated and distorted memories speaks to our need to protect the totems of our lived experience, even though they don't reflect the real thing. Also, Kevin implored me to go larger, much larger. What happens when these images are bigger than you? What happens when we no longer think of them as poster sized and comfortable little items in our lives and our homes? To be honest, I'm still not totally sure yet. I've only been able to spend about an hour or two with this piece thus far. But I can tell you this, the first thing that happens is the relationship with how you navigate the work. There's no resemblance to the smaller ones. When looking at this work for the first time, Kevin couldn't figure out how to look at it. We had just hung it on the wall and he stepped back, but it didn't make any sense. He walked left and he walked right. Finally back and back and back. The piece is 11 feet long and eight feet tall. There's no natural resting point for the eye. You have to spend time studying the canvas, becoming familiar what, with what happens at different distances. Map the thing out in your mind. After this orientation process, you can start seeing different parts of the composition and little vignettes everywhere. Walk back up to the canvas and those vignettes turned out to be their own deep, rich little worlds. They are full of false references and signifiers. The whole piece is an exercise in misdirection and false conclusions. I'm not sure when this piece will be done and where it will find residence, but I'm really excited to go along the journey with it. Okay, I've waxed poetic about my guttural lusting for painting long enough. Now allow me to pull back to some objective standpoint. I don't think painting is the answer for communication. Digitally certain isn't either. There is no one answer. You have to make sense of the message you are trying to convey, align the medium, the marks upon that material, and repeat. <clears throat> For much of my career, I've been making forms that are plant, animal, and mineral all at once. I've been drawn to the effect of the ambiguous organic without thinking particularly critically about what it conveys. Polysemy is the coexistence of many possible meanings. That coexistence of possibility helps dissolve hierarchy and, and power dynamics, and it introduces curiosity about the provenance of an object letting us wonder where the thing has been, as well as what it means now and what its future will be. This is a form that birthed itself from a wood mold that I carved last fall. And these are um, little ambiguous organic objects that I made um, flame working in Murano this summer, Taken the pictures were taken on Torcello. Plants have, long, have been a long-standing subject matter in my work, with the content being the relationship between people and plants, and plants as allies for human autonomy. Remember that, and we'll get back to it later. Vessels are the most visible subject matter in the work I'm currently creating. Vessels are containers for objects, and historically they've been used to symbolize women and the womb. Vessels are of the home, Common, ceremonial, coveted, compelling, discarded, multifunctional, mysterious, powerful, resistant, fragile. 
by blending the forms of several historically ubiquitous domestic objects, I'm attempting to explain why we what we identify as vessel. A generous understanding of what a vessel is could lead to a less confined definition of woman. I'm particularly interested in, the blur in blurring the binary of full versus empty. I've been doing a deep dive on how formal characteristics indicate whether a container, what a, has, a container has undergone. So the mark making clues about <clears throat> whether the form is primed or filled, empty, expectant, or spent. Some vessels shift form depending on what they contain. And for others, it's the contents form that shifts in order to be held. The polysemy comes back up here. I'm fascinated by static forms whose meanings oscillate, making them difficult to define. This evokes time, the present, because you know the object hasn't always been like that, and you presume it won't always be, so you just take it for what it is right now. I've been making a lot of work that's actually ephemeral, radically fragile, is what Blas, Blas calls it. <clears throat> And I'm also intrigued by objects that are not particularly fragile, but are conceptually or are energetically ephemeral. In contrast to Cole's work, I often rely on specific symbols, in this case, vessel forms, to convey content based on my research. Since very few of you will be reading my thesis statement, my, my full written thesis, though so you're plenty welcome to, I'm going to run you all through the vessels that I most I use the most and the content that I'm relying on them to contain. It's a yes and list. It's not everything and it's more than I usually share. So these are pithoi. They were used in ancient Greece to store wine, oil, grain, and dead bodies. It was a pithos, not a box, that was given to Pandora and Hesiod's original telling. And actually, there were a lot of things that were different about that story in 700 BC. I've written about it extensively, if you want to read my independent study from last semester. When I make a pithos, I'm referring to the first woman, to all women, and to the hope that Pandora trapped inside it. The vase shape was used in ancient Greece as a canvas onto which instructions for how to be a respectable woman were painted. In the past year, I've written several articles about Pithoi and the other classical vessels that were co-opted by the Catholic Church as a means of biopower. The vase shape has been used as a signifier throughout Chinese history to refer to women, a reduction of the whole body to just the womb. If you control the objects in the home, you control women because they're also vessels and domestic objects. And if you control people's homes and how they behave inside them, you hold immense power. We've come a long way and also we really have it. Okay, so it's hyper nuanced and invisible, but for me there's a, dif a content difference between a pithos and an amphora. Pithos is larger and has an autonomous foot to stand on. And then the amphora, uh, which were ancient disposable vessels, they were meant for shipping lots of smaller quantities. So when I make amphora, um, I'm thinking about disposability, cosmetics, multiples. That's what, that which is transitory, like uteruses, unfertilized eggs, breath. The internet knows that I'm really into brooms right now. <laughs> Sorry, there aren't citations. They're just like screenshots, you know, that I have in a whole little collection that just says brooms. I didn't main, mean to start making glass brooms. The idea came to me and I became obsessive about solving it from a technical perspective before I knew how they fit into the larger theme of my body, that body of my work. My work is heavily influenced by the rich tradition of Japanese weaving and broom making. Brooms are for cleansing. They relate to the earth and to magic. They're about process and preparation and witches. Brooms remind us that everyday tasks are ceremonial, that the sacred and the mundane are one and the same. There's a long global tradition of weaving family motifs and stories into baskets. 
Baskets are about ancestor lines, symbolism, tribe, indigeneity, land stewardship. Baskets convey women's work as well as the weave and the grid. They're about harvest, abundance, and nourishment. Baskets evoke conversations that happen among the weavers and the spirit line that ensures the spirit doesn't get trapped in the object. During medieval times, women used to tie birthing scrolls with written prayers to their body while they gave birth. This is an example of one of those. It was a Hail Mary to try to not die during childbirth. If a scroll worked for one woman, it was passed to the next. So they would get repeatedly splattered with sweat and blood and herbal potions and goat's milk. Scrolls were used for property and material wealth accounting and to, re and to record life events. Everybody says these don't look like books, but they are. These are books. Um, I'm currently ma making many books with woven glass pages. And uh, the books are bringing history, civilization, the church, allopathic medicine, and knowledge into the conversation. The stewardship of information, the preservation of gate and gatekeeping of history happens in so many physical and non-physical ways. As you've seen, many of these hybrid forms are made of woven glass, which underscores their connection to women's work, domesticity, and tradition, as well as to the fragility and the preciousness of the object's role in stewarding information. In addition to weaving, I, there's a lot of binding in my work. Binding is a repeated emotional gesture that I make to express the feeling of being, of feeling constricted in a situation or a relationship. When I notice that I'm binding material often, it helps me identify how I'm feeling. The binding carries more accessible content as well, such as medical intervention, the bound feet of women, constriction before release and expansion. And binding and weaving are both visible subjects that I've repeatedly created, and so much so that the re repetition and centrality of these two processes, or formal devices, has allowed them to become subject matter. I've surprised myself by making a large body of work out of clear glass. I wasn't planning to make so much clear glass. Um, and this has led, this like reduction of color has led to my color and the found materials that I choose to becoming um, sort of like direct subject matter as well, loaded with meaning. So this brings us to an example of something that Cole and I talk about in our free time. Can a formal device be subject matter if it doesn't carry content? And this is where my friend Stephanie and Kim, who I might be on Zoom, would yell, grab a and make us all drink. <laughs> Our process. That's where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our processes are incredibly important to us, which we've made clear by fetishizing mark making. Recently in a studio visit, my thesis chair, Kevin Jones, said, oh, you're a process artist. Well, yeah, of course. Oh. <laughs> Just as we both frequently veil our content, we've also both hide our process in our work. We want the viewer to guess at what happened to the material and to infer stories about the interventions that it underwent. The mystery of how a thing is made and the tension of not being able to figure it out is part of our content. It's also helped us extend the time viewers stay with the work. We've talked a lot about other parts of our process, but not how we physically make the work. For instance, I'm constantly asked how I weave, how I weave glass. It's fucking magic. <laughs> Magic. And they only give us an hour. So on to the next section. Uh, that's it. No, no, no process. Sorry. <laughs> if you're familiar with us as people, then you have noticed there's a big gaping hole of content that we haven't addressed yet. No, not process. Something else. We're calling these the third rails of our work. And we each have one. We're calling it the third rail because it is so powerful and full of high voltage 
that when it shocks the victim, it holds them there and usually kills them and everything else that it touches. So it's also the beating heart of the system. It's the driving mechanism, the power that moves the train. When we mention these topics by name, we find the conversations get derailed. People already have such strong opinions about these topics that once they're mentioned, all other subject matter and content is obliterated. It's very difficult to observe the nuances that we're trying to bring to the conversation once these third rails have been introduced. Nevertheless, these topics are key to understanding our worldviews, and this is our moment on the soapbox. So, okay, who's going first? I know, let's do the one that's all over the headlines right now. Okay, uh, so we flipped a coin at the beginning of this presentation uh, as the last of the presentational gambits. So that assigned an order. I randomly made slides and renamed them. And so we don't know whose third rail is coming up next. Except we do because they just scroll down. No, we're going to find out. Oh. <laughs> I'm a contemporary pro-abortion artist. I hope my practice directly impacts abortion policy globally and especially here in the state of Louisiana. I hope to become a more effective civil artist by contributing visually to the perception of abortion. And every day I work to normalize abortion as safe and easy to access. Please take a moment to close your eyes and picture what you see in your mind when you think of abortion. At the end, I want you to write on your bingo cards in the back of them and give them to me about this. So specifically, I want to know what your visual associations to abortion are. For the rest of this section, you'll see some of the Im images of how I visualize abortion. Abortion's my third rail. While I want the word to be normalized, as we've discussed, I'm increasingly interested in how, I, how to get at the content through quiet signifiers, to use shrouding as a tool towards clarity. And when I make art about abortion, I'm experimenting with a softer, more nuanced tone. When I speak and write about abortion, precise language is critical. In the reproductive justice community, we're hyper aware of word choice. Many of the words are an attempt to recontextualize, broaden, and neutralize the third veil. Sometimes the live current is useful for shock value. And the word abortion can also be used as a filter to help protect us from having certain un unproductive conversations. Some words intentionally obfuscate and others are meant to offer clarity. These are some more words that I use to talk about abortion. Plants have been a central theme in my art throughout my life. And for more than a decade, I've been incorporating abortifacients into my sculptures. Abortifacients are plants that are used to induce miscarriage. I've been working with abortifacients and reproductive justice initiatives for many years, and now I'm endeavoring to deepen my historical and contemporary knowledge of their use as a core aspect of my graduate research. As Aaron mentioned earlier, concurrent with my graduate program, I'm a community engaged research fellow with the Mellon program here at Tulane. The Mellon Fellowship has offered me an opportunity to expand my engagement with others who are fighting for reproductive justice. As fellows, we reach out to people whose work we want to support, and then if they're interested, we co-build a, a project. So I reached out to Dana Horner, who founded Holistic Abortions, and whose work I've really admired for a long time. And Dana said yes, so I get to work with Dana. And if you're a pro-abortion, if you're pro-abortion, you should follow holistic abortions because it's good content. <clears throat> Dana is a reproductive health educator, an herbalist, a researcher, and an abortion doula who provides direct care for people who are seeking support. 
Dana lives in a state where it's legal to help people in this way. My collaboration with Dana helps me combine my love of craftsmanship and collaboration with my dedication to environmental and reproductive justice, which are inextricably linked. It is also serving as an experimental modality for blending academic research, studio arts practice, and grassroots responses to the social challenge of living in a state with no legal access to abortion. Dana helped co-found the Red Door Collective and continues to work with a collection, a collective of herbalists and researchers on several projects. They conducted a research project that focuses on community-led abortion provision in the, in the United States and in Canada. And for this project, they gathered data from community providers about herbal abortions. And they published a paper about successfully induced miscarriages using herbs. This body of research did not exist before them uh, in the peer, in the published peer reviewed academic sphere. And the use of abortifacients has yet to be taken seriously by most medical professionals. While we want to protect the herbs and ancestral practices, we also want to protect and bolster reproductive autonomy. Dana and her co-authors have been sharing their data and, and dispelling myths at reproductive health and justice conferences. And they're trying to disseminate the research beyond academia. So part of my collaboration with them is to translate the data from this research into sculptures. I'm still in the process of doing this. So you'll have to come to my thesis show and probably subsequent uh, shows for the big reveal. So this is how I'm currently attempting to do this. These are two people's herbal formulas. I'm showing you two so you can see how different they are. There's no formulation, there's no recipe for an herbal abortion. It changes depending on the, per the body and the pregnancy. So like one person could use several different formulas throughout their lives, <clears throat> depending on what's going on with them. So you can see that there's some overlap in which herbs they're using. One person's experience is twice as long as the other. If you swapped it, it might not be exactly the same. It's not that this one was more effective than the other. Um, it just means they're different bodies at different times going through different circumstances. And then you can see at the bottom that there are all these other um, notes like orgasm and flower essence and rest and ceremony that don't fit neatly onto the table, which I love. Brooms, for example will come in handy to reference how pregnancy releases are both ceremonial and they're mundane. Each form herbal formula is designed to include at least one herb that produces each of these four actions. So these are the actions that happen, whether it's um, an abortion, a miscarriage, or a, a birth. And I started thinking of these like a list of formal devices like so that like the form isn't complete without for example composition texture color and light i've been experimenting with language and gesture relating verbs to the herbal actions so the herbal actions on the left and then over here is a picture of the words words that i wrote down on the ground um before i started casting so <clears throat> I'm trying to, I'm attempting to like do those, these um, verbs to the glass. So this is mugwort in a sand mold before I cast glass over it. Mugwort's in a memnagogue and a progesterone blocker. And in Dana's words, it's not, we shouldn't count on it as a progesterone blocker. It doesn't fully block progesterone, but it's very effective in memnagogue. And it stimulates the circulatory system um, as an memnagogue, which includes blood flow to the uterus. So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about flow and um, when I'm working with mugwort. We also know that mugwort induces vivid dreams. So we can think about that as disorganizing grounded material into spirit. There's biology and physical science behind herbal medicine, and there's also ener energetic effects. I'm incorporating both of these into the forms that I make. The binding that I was talking about before, <clears throat> which started as an emotion and then became a formal device, has now evolved into a set of techniques 
that I use to signify the oxytocic actions of herbs when they promote uterine contraction. This is a clay form that I fired with, uh, Raku fired with Penny Royal. The other day, Dana, it's like Thursday, I, Dana and I were talking about Penny Royal, and I mentioned that even though it's a memnagogue and an oxytoxic, the dominant way that I portray it is watery and steamy. This is because it's safe only when taken as a water formulation. And Dana said, yes, it's like water that flows into smaller spaces, like, like a river getting smaller. Spending time with the plants, tasting them, tending them, meditating with them is a huge part of my practice. For the herbalists in the room, these are the plants that I'm working with, the airport efficients that I'm working with for my thesis work. I've shifted abortion from subject matter to content. So not so visible. Yes, meaning. The womb is vessel and the shared actions it undergoes in abortion, miscarriage, and birth are visually shrouded subjects of my current work. Just as the most domestic as most domestic and hermetic labor goes unseen, the evidence of abortion, abortifacient plants and ceremony is present, but the actors and their actions are veiled. It's clear that the material has undergone intervention, but the process or history is unclear. This visual polysemy is a form of protection. It's often safer when we can't tell whether the vessel is full or empty, or if it's ever contained something. The result is shadow work, evidence of the unseen. Right now I'm explaining the inner workings of my process because this is a lecture, and the thinking and writing and talking is an important part of my process. When I sculpt about abortion, I turn it into form and movement. It's a different language or code to talk about the thing so that we can access different emotional responses to the content than we might otherwise be able. And what appears in the gallery will be the mark makings of scholarship and of collective care. Okay, cool. So I have approximately nine minutes to talk at you about AI. <laughs> I know this is the thing that you've been secretly or not secretly been wanting the whole time. You've been thinking, you use computers, you must be into AI. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. The world is flooded with conversations about AI right now. Is it good? Is it evil? Is it going to take my job? Will my kids be safe? I thought Dolly died. Why is he painting all these deep fakes? Can you fix my computer? <laughs> That one's not related to AI, but I do get it all the time. So the reason I don't talk about AI in relation to my art anymore is for many reasons. A big starting point is because I'm not using AI as subject or content. We'll circle back to that. I use AI all the time, and you do too. The pictures you take every day on your phone are AI enhanced. You have not been directly taking pictures with a CMOS sensor on your cell phone for many years now. There's more computer vision and AI happening than anything else at this point. We stopped packing more pixels into the phones when we realized software could make things look way better for less money. And you don't have to be a good photographer. The AIs are trained to auto enhance your photos based on what we, what they know we as people think are good photos. The autocomplete and grammar correction in your email, that's AI. When I write code, I am directly getting help from an AI assistant called GitHub Copilot. I also ask ChatGPT to make little scripts for me all the time. Most of the GIFs, except for SpongeBob, were created by asking ChatGPT to formulate FFmpeg commands for me. FFmpeg is an incredibly powerful, but dense command line tool for editing videos. The documentation is thorough, but it takes a lot longer than saying FFmpeg blob JPEG into GIF at 5 FPS ping pong and loop. ChatGPT spits the, spits the command back for me to run. Magic. Another reason I avoid the term AI in this relation, in relation to this body of work, is that I'm using one very specific neural network. Again, specific language. I say neural network since that is the industry term. Either that or machine learning model, but I'm a sucker for alliteration. 
Anyways, this body of work is using the vague, nebulous AI in the news like everyone else, albeit at higher doses since I work digitally as a starting place so frequently. This is one very specific neural network I trained. I took 28 paintings from the Mets Open Access Program and sketched over top of them on my iPad. Important to note, the Mets Open Access is a searchable API that makes 475,000 artworks available for free without usage restrictions. You can search by name, date, description, medium, country of origin. It's pretty neat, you should check it out. All right, back to the paintings. You can see the input on the screen. This is a collection of 28 paintings, largely late Dutch plein air, French impressionist. I was very, uh, I found this style very influential when I was young in developing an appreciation and taste for art. I remember going to the Chicago Art Institute when I was about 20, when I spent all day there, eight hours, open to close. The impressionist paintings encap captivated me for at least two of those hours. All right, cliff notes. Professor Zhu Yangzhu and associates wrote a mathematical paper and published it. They posted their code for running said mathematical system on computers. I downloaded their code and ran their mathematical model on my own images. These are the tests that I made after some initial training. I will not go into more detail now. This is not the time or the place. AI is fundamentally changing our world in massive tectonic ways. Sometimes it is as visible as an earthquake or tsunami, and others it is just the ground slowly shifting imperceptibly underneath us. So what's wrong with AI? The two major problems I see with AI are accuracy and attribution. Accuracy meaning the models don't know whether the code or word correction it gave is right in the broader context of the world. There's many other detailed examples of where AI just doesn't do accuracy, but they aren't particularly relevant for a discussion focused on art. Attribution, on the other hand, is squarely relevant. The latent image models that are so popular, Dolly, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, et cetera, and large language models, ChatGPT, BARD, et cetera, are illegal. There is no two ways about it. They're using copyrighted material. In the best case, they are simply failing to acknowledge the source, and in the worst case, they are blatantly ignoring that the image or text has all rights reserved. So in the best case, if the model could attribute the source of an image or, or section of text back to the Creative Commons source it came from, they would actually be following the rules we've set up to protect intellectual property. I'm all for erasing, destroying, eliminating all copyright patent protections, and intellectual property protections. I think ideas are better when shared, built upon, and treated with inherent respect. But that's not the world we live in, and it could change going forward. But it's not the way the world was 5, 10, or 30 years ago when people started putting ideas onto the internet and said copyright. They didn't make the choice in the context of an all-consuming, data-mining AI world. So how does this get resolved? I don't know. It's not the thing I'm making art about, nor do I care to. I'm trying to make a future self. If I can train an AI to take pictures like me and draw like me and be influenced by the same art as me and constantly be in conversation with me, I can make a future version of myself that is different than the one I will become. Conversations outside of yourself, with yourself. Is that possible? I don't know. But in terms of making art that is examining consciousness and what it means, I literally can't think of a better way to examine my own consciousness than try to distill a part of it into something else and see how each one of us changes. Here are some early examples of me collaborating with different AIs to make art. These were made with Stable Diffusion version 1.4. These were made with Stable Diffusion and then processed by my own drawing prediction model. I then hooked up these drawing predictions to a drawing machine. 
I'm attempting to give my art making AI consciousness the ability to make art in the same way I do, digitally and physically. Over the next five, 10, 30 years, I'll keep enhancing my art making AI consciousness by enabling it to understand language, images, and express itself directly however it wants to. But having these discussions now and forcing them to be the content of my work, that makes me a sci-fi writer, not a visual artist. I'm robbing the work that I'm currently making of its voice and nuance by attempting to inject it full of intentionality that doesn't show up in the work. This is my favorite litmus test as an artist. You have intentions, yes, and thoughts and curiosities and influences. But try to separate yourself from the special relationship that you have with yourself. And be honest, is it in the work? For me, my art making AI consciousness, it's not in the work, not yet. That is the work of a lifetime. There we go. I think the original thing that we bonded over was our ongoing rant about the <clears throat> lack or siloed existence of critical discourse in the art community here in New Orleans. By siloed, I mean that we go to one, other's, one another's exhibits and talk about it amongst our friends, but there's very little contemporary writing and public discussion about what we're making. We no longer expect our work to be formally reviewed like it is in other major cities. This is detrimental to our whole community. Making sense of the work we see and sharing our observations has made a huge impact on how we engage with our own work. Talking and writing about art in an inclusive way is important. We regularly return to the idea how we can, after grad school, create a space for art discourse in New Orleans. If you're interested in following along or conversing or better yet collaborating in this community discussion, you're cordially invited to slide into our DMs. <laughs> we were awfully revealing with you tonight. If you want to come evaluate how well we are conveying our subject matter and content through our chosen formal devices and processes, my thesis show will be up March 4th through 12th, and Caitlin's will be up April 11th through 19th. You can also see some of her beautiful work at the Ogden Museum, currently in the Louisiana Contemporary Show, up now through February 18th. Anything you want to share about abortion visuals um, will help inform a project that Dana and I are currently working on. So please put, if you have notes, them into this basket here. Um, or you can email or text or, again, the DMs. Um, Oh yeah, those we stole those. A lot of those pencils are from the office closet. So can you give them back to us, please? Because we took a lot of them. Um, so, <laughs> so pencils back in the basket, please. Um, and we hope that you all won at your bingo cards. I think that's possible that you all won. So tag us in a post or send one of us an email with a picture of your winning bingo card. Um, and we'll coordinate sending you a limited edition print of a collaborative work. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I know we started late. We, I don't know whether we have time for Q and A. You may, if you haven't, if you haven't won, you did. You might want to try to draw a word out of us. With You're missing a. one thing for your bingo. Yeah, ask a good pointed question. But if you need to read, we're late. Yeah. Do should I fail? We have like 15 minutes out of date for Q and A, so. Thank you. Yes, great. Has any? So, 
in the first part of your lecture, you spoke about uh, trying to find more specific words that better communicate the ideas that you're trying to get across. And then later on in the lecture, you talked about, for you, I think it was the term woman and how it can sort of start to encompass all these things. When should people try and, uh, I guess, try and find something more specific and when should they turn something uh, that is, or that was uh, an idea of something or something that was specific and turn it into something that's more encompassing? Um, well, as one example, I've been using the word ambiguous a lot. Um, and then, I don't know, probably three weeks ago, I was like, this isn't doing it anymore. Like, I can't, like, milk this word any like, longer. It's just, like, it's done. I've done it. It's, like, it's not, it's not containing everything that I need. And um, I would say, like, overstretched it. And so, then I had more conversations about that, and I didn't come up with anything really much better. And then, I, when writing this, I discovered Pelesmi, which I'm like, no, it was that. I can do whatever I want with Pelesmi. And um, <laughs> just, just, just like, make it up because nobody knows. Although I didn't make it up, I gave you the real definition. Um, so, like, <laughs> uh, so I would say that like the like a word is a vessel kind of shows itself, like some whether have, like how static, how flexible it is, and and that changes for us all, right? Like, there's, like in society, like sometimes you just get to an impasse where like Ugh, I can't do anything else, and and so. We just are trying to read that together, trying to see whether you can. Because some of words we are like, some people are like, no, I don't want to change that. And I'm like, but And there's a fight, you know, there's a, there's a discourse about that. But I don't know if you have any The pieces at the Ogden were some of my favorite pieces in that exhibition. And for anybody who's in the audience, it's basically the, the work that you did with sort of the, the glass sheets with the impressions of the earth. Do you plan to continue to do more work in that area? Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we really wanted this all back. Um, there is a slide with them. Um, yeah, so that's a process that I, uh, this is a triptych of Rue, uh, the plant is Rue in this case. Um, and I'm really loving this process because it, turning black, like making it so you can't tell whether it's glass and whether it's fabric or like the tearing, it's, it's got a lot of possibility. Um, so yes, I have been making more and I can, will continue. It's, this is um, a process that I'm teaching in my class how to make as well right now. Um, and uh, it, like, I make frit and then um, make molds and um, uh, now I'm doing them. Tell me how I do it. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I really love the manipulating of them when it's hot in the kiln. That's the most important part for me. So the, I end up getting this like sheets and then I get into the kiln with that crazy leather outfit and I like, manipulate them while they're hot. And um, it's Sometimes painful, very exhilarating, exciting, um, and so absolutely, yes, um, I will continue to. And I'm like playing with color a lot in that form. Thank you both uh, for your presentation. Earlier in the lecture, you were both describing your collaborations with others, close collaborations. And I made a note that both of you used words uh, that invoke something of the religious or mystical uh, in that context. So, Cole, you said your temple partners, and Caitlin, you talked about, you know, we're in the same cult. Um, and I'm curious to hear more about how elements of the religious, maybe like faith and belief, um, appear in your work. Uh, I'll start there. So I um, describe myself as agnostically atheist, which is um, a fun conversation to have a few drinks in. Um, so it's something that I really like. 
avoid the symbols of because it's not something that I engage with. Um, it's actually like one of the things that was most surprising about forming a really close working relationship with Caitlin is that I am not spiritual, I'm not religious, I just don't really tune into those frequencies for whatever reason. And uh, Caitlin is the witchiest person I know. Um, her ability to intuit the world around her is just like out of this world crazy. Uh, when my daughter was being born, uh, Laura started going into labor at like 4 a.m. and then Caitlin texted me at 5 a.m. being like, uh, I just woke up from a deep sleep. I want to make sure everything was going okay. Uh, thinking about y'all. Just like, what the fuck, Caitlin? <laughs> Um, so it's not something that I, I work with because it's not something that takes up space in my mind and I, um, I don't know how to address it. I try to avoid subjects that I can't speak to um, from my own experience. So that's kind of where I've ended up with the area that I'm investigating. It's something that I, I, I obviously know, I am conscious. So it's something that I can really explore fully without interfering with other people's interpretations of it. Yeah, that's a, I mean, a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I definitely have a spiritual practice. I, I had to train, I like, spent a lot of time, I don't know, in the last decade or maybe more than that, um, like grappling with the word God and faith so that I could use them in a way that didn't, that was authentic to me. Um, that took some real work. I um, didn't, I grew up in uh, like, commune that uh, <laughs> encouraged me to have a strong relationship with nature and to other people and to myself, but um, not uh, not to God with that word. Um, and so, like, the spirit is probably the word that I use most. But um, so it's probably it's easier to I guess I would say it's easier for me to work with um, with spirit as it comes through with plants probably the, like, the most direct relationship that I have, and then that shows up in my work all the time. It's also like a material. Well, just I just wanted to say that the glass, glass, glass is a material is quite, I mean, I think lots of materials do this, but glass like speaks and, and, and mirrors in this way that you're like, I'm not, it's doing something to me as much as I'm doing something to it. And, I'm seeing thanks for your nods, y'all. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, they're like as far as where if sphere is in a material, it's definitely glass. So, a material question. Um, as craftspeople and laymen originally would then come to this institution and have have moved or transformed from one material to another, how do you see your practices continuing to evolve once you leave this institution? Mm. Uh, great question. So that was one of the biggest things that I wanted to get out of coming to grad school was to restart my practice and figure out what it looked like. How do I set this up to maintain it for the rest of my life? Um, and I've been, uh, really excited, especially over the past three months, I've started kind of finding new ways of making work that I know will feed me for a long time to dance back to and, uh, and do great. Um, the methods are going to be different when I'm not in an institution with this kind of resource, but the rendering styles and techniques of creating these collages and these murals and growing them into larger and larger things is something that I'm super excited to do. And uh, understanding the different ways that I can go about making my work at larger and smaller scales is something that I had really no conceptualization before. So I've made drawings that are this size that like I cherish as much as the, the large scale painting that I'm working on. So finding that new way of making has been something that I absolutely was seeking and 
didn't really start clicking that it was there until uh, just a couple months ago. You didn't fully quit, successfully quit your day job yet either. So. Oh, no, I'm still working. <laughs> <laughs> Try to, you can't quit a company you start. Right now. Um, I um, had a run 220 in my home studio, and I don't know how to that question, but um, the, I, I guess like I, I need bigger films in my home studio now because I just can't see, like, I can't, and now I'm not going to have so I guess I'm going to have to teach on it So um, the access, adjunct, access to hot class is like, a, I'm like, bullshit. I'm spoiled now. Hi, you're I'm, a I'm, a yeah. Yeah, I'm in the cult. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, lots of people have studios and I'm friends with a lot of them. So um, I don't know what that will look like exactly, but there's a lot of options. And I was a full-time artist before and I'm still will um, Although I hope. I don't know if I'm going to make stuff for like Christmas sales in the same way that I did before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will this Christmas sale though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not what I'm going to sell. Well, it's similar. It's right there in this, in this gallery. You can definitely go buy some shit. Anyone want to send us out on a question? We're going to wrap it up and do it. Go on once. I'll ask something. Um, yeah. You know, you both, uh, you both had a, a lot of, um, I guess what I'll call translations. There's a lot of themes, you know, vessel, moment, history, identity, time, technology. And there's translations, it seems like, you know, through all that. And it's always asymmetrical, you know, plan and class. And I wonder, you know, how much of that has to do with the material? How much of that, of, of, of the, the, the affect that's produced is actually emergent? And how much is it? Is intentional or planned, would you say? I moved into materials that allow it to be more fluid and emergent. That it's something that I found was really uh, lacking in my digital process. Um, this is something that comes up a lot in discussions with artists. It's working intuitively, like feeling the materials and the spirit moved in a certain way, and. I find my digital process doesn't allow a ton of space for that for me because it's also a place that I work. So I'm used to sitting down at a computer and like getting through, um, which is why I was really focusing on finding ways to bring the computer into the studio with me in new ways so that I can be like giving it paint and collaborating in new ways with uh, the code that I'm writing. So. The, the medium is the message, and finding out ways to change my practice to be still digital but incorporate materiality and, and new ways is great. It, it, it's freeing me from the repetitiveness of sitting at my, at my desk at my computer. Um, yeah, and I. I was just thinking, reflecting on the different ways that I use glass, and so, for instance, with this work, it's like there's a lot of prep, right? I'm rolling the plant, the plant out into the clay, I'm setting up a mold, I'm doing, I'm like making the frid, I'm sifting it over, I'm doing this whole thing, and then at the, at the end, um, when it's hot, I'm all mitted up, and it's got fiber cracks all over it, and I'm just kind of like, <laughs> I'm like, just make a motion, and then we see what happens after. And I do practice the motion before, like the gesture before I go in the kiln. Like I do, I like get into a rhythm and I just sort of looking for this one going. And then I do the thing. But I don't know until the next day what it, what happened. So there's that. And then I would say like when Max and I are, when we're casting, there's ton, it's super urgent. We're like, okay, what are we doing here? This is how we, what we think might happen. We, sit, we do a little setup. But it's, and that I think it's with hot class all the time. It's just like, I am like drawing a picture of on the ground and being like, that's what it could be. And then we just see, like we like strive towards it and are surprised every time. Thanks everyone so much.